As we begin to focus on the organizational factors that affect crisis communication, it's useful to think about the intersection of management and communication functions within organizations. We can then focus on their convergence in crisis planning. Of course, crises create unique management challenges, and so by better understanding the factors that influence crisis management using Lusmore's theory of crisis management, and also applying a public relations model that considers communication as a process that extends throughout an organization's activities, we will begin to get a better picture about the complex organizational dynamics that affect its ability to reflect on and manage crises in real time. In his theory of crisis management, Lusmore argues that the first challenge of crisis management is that power struggles are likely to emerge during crises. These can occur within the organization as it tries to manage the situation, but they can also emerge externally between organizations in the same industry, between companies and NGOs and companies and governments, and so on. And they can emerge for a host of reasons, ranging from who's responsible to who will get credit for acting. So if we understand where the particular power struggles are likely to emerge in a particular crisis, then we can begin to understand existing tensions and take actions to diffuse them. Lusmore's second crisis management challenge is that communication requires efficiency. That is, getting the right message to the right people at the right time. Lusmore argues that one of the critical challenges during crises is making sure that this happens. Yet, there's also a suggestion in his theory that communication during crises isn't necessarily about the niceties, that it's more functional. Yet, from a relationship management perspective, while there are probably moments where we're going to have to be a bit command and control in our communication style, crisis management doesn't mean that we necessarily interact with others in ways that are problematic for long-term relationship management. This is both an interpersonal as well as an organizational communication challenge during crises. Third, crises tend to encourage conflict. In this case, when we're talking about conflict and crisis from a management perspective, we're talking about conflicts within the organization. Research on organizational conflict identifies these as six primary sources of conflict within organizational settings. During crises, these conflict sources are likely to be amplified by the emotional intensity. This can help to create organizational problems in managing the crisis, as these conflicts emerge because it means that in order to manage the crisis, the conflict also has to be managed. So this suggests that crises are really an inside-out problem in the context of organizational management. Everything has to be working internally in order for the external crisis to be handled effectively. So this is one of the reasons that we've spent some time on effective teamwork in this lecture series, because crises are handled by teams, so it's imperative that effective crisis management involves great teamwork. If problems exist for an organization or team in terms of these factors, then those problems will certainly manifest during the crisis. So, from a crisis management perspective, it's to an organization's distinct advantage to have functional teams that they can actually rely on. Fourth, crises tend to discourage collective responsibility, meaning we like someone to blame. Most people have a bit of a predisposition to minimizing the perception that they're at fault. Now, sometimes this is because there's a cultural factor about face-saving, Sometimes we're afraid of the consequences, but mostly there's a psychological reaction involved that suggests that most people just don't want to cause undue problems. We feel bad about that. So averting blame is some com combination of manifestations of our own guilt about not wanting to personally see negative consequences. But, of course, this is problematic during crisis management because a lot of times people are too worried about who's going to be held responsible that they don't focus on solving the problem. In a lot of cases, when we think about emotion and crisis, we only really think about external stakeholders. But managing emotions for internal stakeholders is often just as challenging and as vital as for those outside the organization. In his theory, Lusmore identifies four factors that will help manage the challenges that we've just been talking about. The first is social adjustment. 
the period of social adjustment induced by a crisis and really a new social order that emerges are really dependent on the overlap of interests within the organization the balance of power between opposing interest groups the sensitivity of management and the occurrence of natural environmental events this means to successfully manage a crisis organizations have to create the conditions for social adjustment the assumption that the organization and the people in it will change is just a reality in most serious crises this means that everyone in the organization as well as its stakeholders have to get used to this especially once the crisis subsides but this isn't a passive process the second component to good crisis management is coping with behavioral instability the management of unpredictable behavioral change is a key component of the crisis management process because crises of course have a destabilizing effect they can create behavioral instability by creating conditions that really desensitize people to the needs of others and so the tensions end up representing advanced signs of change happening so this involves ensuring that people become or remain other focused and not just to focus on how the crisis is personally affecting them. Naturally, this is most applicable to internal stakeholders, but building a sense of community experience and identity with external stakeholders is certainly one of the ways that crises can be successfully managed. When people are taken out of the crisis mentality, their behaviors stabilize and things begin to work again. But this means that organizations have to be the sources of stability even through a crisis. Third, in managing crises, social structures also have to be managed. The issue of social structure is a key factor in the crisis management process because that which emerges in response to a crisis and influences its reactions and the organization's efficiency. Social structures of organizations and communities help to influence reactions by determining really the efficiency of information dissemination and the groups receiving that information. At the heart of invoking effective social structures for disseminating information is an organizational focus on reducing uncertainty. When the organization successfully manages uncertainty, it reduces misunderstandings, disagreements, frustrations, tension, and ultimately conflict. In modern contexts, this can be achieved through a number of means, from face-to-face -to, -face to social media, but remember it is a matter of reaching the right audiences at the right times. Finally, Lusmore argues that to manage crises effectively, diametric opportunities have to be managed. So through a combination of what's happening outside the organization, inside the organization, and the nature of the crisis itself, Crises can create environments that can be both constructive and destructive to crisis management efforts. In a destructive context, a crisis can induce management inertia because it discourages collective responsibility, teamwork, and effective communication at a time when all three of these are of heightened importance. So this is what we've been talking about with the challenges. Paradoxically, this inertia tends to draw an organization into the self-perpetuating cycle of escalation, so it prolongs the crisis and ends up wasting managerial resources. However, as, provide, as well as providing opportunities for division and conflict, crises also provide opportunities for increased cohesion, harmony, and efficiency. So these can also be self-perpetuating, shortening the crisis, and reducing the investment of manage managerial resources. Lusmore's theory of crisis management is one that has been cited in a lot of crisis research and practitioner work in the last couple of decades, but I think that one of the key elements that his identification of challenges and factors influencing successful crisis management demonstrates is that effective communication is likely to predict the success or failure of crisis response efforts. Internally, managing our teams and our organizations relies on cre creating a productive work environment, and externally it takes the same themes as a way to focus on people's identification with the organization and their willingness to work through a situation collaboratively.
It's for this reason that crisis management is increasingly being seen as a public relations function. This is true not only in research, but in practice itself. Crisis management specialists are often most likely to be employed by public relations or communications firms and will most often come from communication backgrounds of some kind, not necessarily exclusively management backgrounds. So because of what we've been talking about with issues in crisis management in the context of the stakeholder relationship model, Stack's argument here should make sense. He's arguing that crisis management from a structural perspective should look like any other stra strategic campaign that an organization can initiate. It's one that has clear objectives, devises an aligned strategy to meet those objectives, executes them, and then evaluates the effectiveness of the campaign. What this lets us do is to start demystif to demystify the strategy component of crisis communication a bit so that we're relying on structures and knowledge that we're already familiar with as we begin to think about a crisis response. So Stacks began by identifying the qualities of effective crisis management and in so doing he identified four distinctive qualities. First, that effective crisis management begins with a communication professional taking part in the development and subsequent de dissemination of a crisis management plan. Now, this doesn't mean that the communication professional is solving the material problem. What it does mean is that we're instrumental in coordinating the effort to manage the crisis both internally and externally. This is something of an important distinction. Remember, we're not engineers, environmental scientists, policy makers, and the like. What we do is coordinating the communication amongst people and groups. So we have to make sure that what we're taking on makes sense. But the thing is that because communication is an inherent part of solving problems, we certainly have an important role to play. Second, Effective crisis management needs to take into account the type of organization the plan will manage. Crisis plans for companies, nonprofits, governments, schools, and so on are all going to have differences, and they need to be customized to the particular organization and set of circumstances in which the organization is operating. For example, during the 2010 BP crisis in the Gulf of Mexico, one of the most embarrassing realities that came to light was that all of the major oil companies, not just BP, had problematic crisis plans. For example, when talking about oil catastrophes, most of their plans focused on Arctic conditions. So they're talking about fur seals and not manatees. They're talking about cold water issues, not warm water issues. And most were so outdated that upon review, some of their core contact people were actually dead. In the congressional hearings, this was cited as one of the major reasons that material problems in, in the explosion and in the leak were slow to be addressed. That, to be perfectly blunt, they didn't have the right resources ready. Third, effective crisis management also has to take into account not only the organization itself, but also to realize that all organizations have different subgroups and subsets, each of which has different needs and capabilities, so organizations are really a composite of these smaller groups. Think about most organizational charts. We have different departments, different core functions. In a crisis, though, cross-functional teams are required. One of the questions that organizations have to ask themselves is whether they have the structures and experience in cross-functional teamwork. In the technology sectors, for example, cross-functional teamwork has become an operational norm where product development teams have everyone from engineers to HR to PR working on them so they're ready to manage problems and concerns in different ways than organizations where people from different groups rarely work together. Likewise, outside the organization, what kinds of relationships and interactions does an organization have with different stakeholder groups, ranging from strategic alliance partners to government and so on? During crises, most crisis managers are activating assets inside the organization as well as outside the organization because most crises will involve some kind of government agency, often health, and a variety of others. Each one of these represents subsystems that organizations have to think about. Finally, 
Effective communication management involves developing plans to communicate via the most appropriate means to reach the intended audiences. This means that organizations should not only think about key talking points for different types of crises, but also ensure that these talking points are aligned with their current practice, stakeholder concerns about the crisis, and that they're thinking about the most appropriate channels for those messages as well. All this is a starting point, but drafts of talking points, media releases, social media releases, and the like need to be ready to go so that they can be modified to the specifics of a crisis very quickly. So Stack's argument for what is good crisis planning and crisis management involves five components. The first is to account for the organizational structure, to explicitly account for the entity itself, its system, culture, and changes within it. Second, likewise, good crisis management focuses on the infrastructure for an organization, not only how the material resources flow into, within, and outside of an organization, but also how information flows with, around an organization. For example, in some work on food security, a group of researchers from the University of Kentucky were looking at the infrastructure of food distribution in the United States and found that a substantial percentage of all lettuce consumed in the U.S. came from one of a handful, four or five, shipment containers in California. So, if a contaminant were to enter a single batch of lettuce, because of the transportation structure, by the time the first case could be diagnosed for most food-based contaminants, the lettuce would have literally been distributed coast to coast with the potential for fairly catastrophic results in the case of serious contaminants. So for these researchers, understanding the physical infrastructure helped them plan for managing risk and also planning for crisis containment. Third, Stacks focuses on stakeholders and argues that organizations have to view internal, external, and intervening stakeholders as critical to crisis management and crisis planning. He talks about intervening stakeholders as any group that can affect, either positively or negatively, the organization's ability to manage the crisis. Fourth, Stacks argues that traditional public relations models need to be enacted during crisis management. Of course, this means press agentry, public information, two-way asymmetric, and two-way symmetric communication as part of the overall communication and engagement plan. In a modern digital context, this means ensuring that traditional media is engaged as well as social media, with both listening and direct engagement with as many stakeholders as possible, while maintaining a very consistent set of messages. Finally, with regards to message strategy, Stax argues that good communication is about being both informative and persuasive. People need accurate and good information coming from the organization in crisis, as well as its partners. But he argues that for good crisis communication, it also needs to be strategic or persuasive because it needs to target specific audience needs, be objective-centered, and be compelling. Now, all of this has to be done within an ethical and culturally appropriate framework and adapted to different stakeholder groups and across different channels. But so long as there is an informative and persuasive component, organizations are much more likely to be able to move forward. So when we take these two approaches, a very traditional crisis management approach, as well as the multidimensional PR approach to crisis management, we can begin thinking about crisis planning as one of the core activities to ensure that an organization can effectively deal with crises that emerge. I think this is also a useful way to begin to think about it because it refocuses our attention on structures that are familiar, a campaign's focus so that we can take what we already know how to do, develop campaigns, and modify it based on the uniqueness of the crisis context.